Welcome back to Sepsis Voices with Dr. Ron. I'm your host, Dr. Ron Daniels, and today I'm joined by renowned journalist and editor Matthew Dancona. Matthew is editor-at-large of the New European, as well as contributing editor to Prospect and a columnist for the Evening Standard. And he's held previous similarly auspicious editor roles with The Spectator, the slow news outlet Tortoise, and he's also the former deputy editor of the Sunday Telegraph. And the reason Matt is here today is he is a sepsis survivor. So he's more than qualified to speak around the issue of sepsis representation in the media. Matthew, it's a pleasure to have you here today with us. Well, it's great to be here, Rob. Thank you very much for inviting me on. More than welcome. So could we could we start with your own sort of sepsis experience, yes. you know, how it happened, how you felt and what you learned from it? Uh, well, um, it, uh, it, a lot is the answer to the final question. Uh, but the, the the sort of story in brief was that this is seven years ago in July 2016. I started to feel very unwell generally and also some very sharp stomach pains. And I was in Germany doing some work for Sky Arts and um, and it really became overwhelming. And I, I got home. I was in quite a state, um, consulted a doctor who said it's probably, um, you know, stomach virus, something like that, gave me some anti-vomiting medication and um, some antibiotics and so on. And I, I, should, I should have persisted because I knew that something more fundamental was wrong, but I, I, I didn't. Um, and I sort of, I think as, I think men are worse than women. I, you know, I sort of soldiered, I did that soldiering on thing, which was very foolish actually, and, and, and dicing with death. The general feeling of malaise, um, stomach problems, you know, um, vomiting, um, uh, many symptoms which I now realise are typical of sepsis, um, got worse over the summer. And in September, I I woke up one morning and I couldn't get up. I, every time I got up, I just fainted. And so my my father, I was living with my father at the time. He's 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 now no longer with us, but he you know said, "Are you all right?" And I said, "Absolutely not." And he called an ambulance and. Um, uh, they came and they had to carry me downstairs um, and I was in a really bad way and and in, and in real pain. Um, so the initial when I got to University Hospital Lewisham, um, the initial thought was that this was probably a perforated ulcer and, and that sounded right because the agony was, you know, <laughs> consonant with that. And, um, you know, their thoughts were, well, probably uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out and then you'll recover. And uh, they, they sort of gave it an appendicitis scale, sort of you'll be out of here in no time. And I remember my, you know, incredibly pompous for, for the last words before I went under was, you know, well, I'm very busy. I've got lots of things planned. Anyway, um, I, the next thing I know, I'm coming out of um, uh, unconsciousness um, and there's a nurse holding my hand saying, Matt, my name's Sally, you've done very, very well, you're much better. But I have to tell you, you've been in a coma for 10 days. And when they'd gone in to um, the, 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 ulcer, the pain from the ulcer saved my life without question, along with the brilliance of uh, the surgeons and my and my specialists and nurses um, that when they went in, they found that I had quite a, a serious case of abdominal um, sepsis, which I fortunately only later discovered is, you know, very serious. And um, they made the clearly correct decision to put me in an induced coma so that they could fire a industrial strength uh, cocktail of antibiotics and other medications through me to, to get to get rid of the poison. Um, and they did. And it worked. Uh, and I was um, in uh, intensive care and then high dependency for, um, I think, a total of 11 days and then in a in a regular ward. And all in all, out all, in total, out in three weeks, which I think, under the circumstances, was, you know, a break upon break. I mean, I was so lucky, um, and um, I convalesced um, pretty quickly. I was discharged as an outpatient, I think, within three months, and was back writing um, journalism, albeit from home, um, on you know for for Trump's election in 2016. So. On every front, I was incredibly lucky, but there's a kind of alternative universe where I wasn't. And particularly if um, the pain had not been sufficient to get me into hospital. And so 
the you, you know my, my first takeaway is I, I remain kind of um, almost mystically grateful to the people that got me well and indeed I've stayed in touch with one or two of them and, and it, it, it's it, it's it's very deep in me that sense of gratitude and you know ill fortune it, it's funny actually because I look back on it on a, as a great experience. It wasn't very nice for my loved ones, you know, who who went through, you know, horrible experience. But for me, it was, I'm, you know, I'm no longer feeling pain. I'm better. I got lucky, and I was discharged very quickly. So, so it was sort of, you know, I, I felt very smiled upon, and and I also felt well, any tiny little things along the way down the line, I can do to raise awareness about this or, or help people or whatever I you know I'm it's the least I can do um, but it did it did make me pause for thought because as I'd kind of during that summer as I'd kind of been powerfully aware that something was not right at no point that I thought it might it might be sepsis so th that, that you know I set my face to thinking well that's a message that's clearly very important to get across so that you know the next person might go to their GP and and press the points a bit harder than I did. Absolutely. And and that's the the essence behind our campaign. Just ask, could it be sepsis? It is about awareness, but it, it's about empowerment. And, you know, just as a comment to something you said there, we do find that often the loved ones of those affected by sepsis not just whilst they're in hospital, but also whilst they're recovering at home, because you were quite fortunate in this regard, but it can take many, many months for them to get oh. back to their full level of function. It's incredibly difficult. And I think the loved ones are often forgotten in this journey, aren't they? It, I mean, that's the thing about it, isn't it, about uh, any form of um, serious disease, Ron, is that you kind of, it's like throwing a, a, a brick into a, um, a pond. There are these concentric circles of um, suffering. Uh, affecting other people. It's a social event, actually, when someone suffers a, a medical crisis. It's not just, you know, the, the core of it is the relationship between the patient and his um, physicians and nurses. Obviously, that's the sort of beating heart of the whole thing. But around that, there's a whole kind of um, group or circle of, of people whose lives are being capsized. And in a way, that's the thing I feel worst about. I mean, I, I, I thought I, I to this day feel humbled by how lucky I was, but I, I do feel bad for my children and my father, in particular my brothers looked after me very well. You know, all those people, they all helped out in a big way. And and although I think it was clear that I was out of the fatality zone, um, you know, not that long after I came out of surgery, you know, I was on a ventilator, I was in, in a coma, you know, the, for, for someone visiting their their father or their son or their brother you know th this it's quite a sight um and you know i really regret that it, it, it must have been horrible yeah yeah tra traumatizing now th the other thing you mentioned was was a parallel universe and <laughs> you described this brilliantly in terms of your your very vivid and real hallucinations or real to you hallucinations whilst you were in in hospital and and of course you shared this in in you know very sort of alarming yet amusing detail on 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 tortoise media why was it important for you to tell your story in that way well i mean you know journalists are um incorrigible give them a lemon and they'll make lemonade so so there's that um secondly um i i read a bit about once i realized that i'd been through a, a period of icu delirium um uh i I, I, I compared it to some of the other, the, you know, nastier versions of ICU delirium, and, and and my experience of it again was very fortunate because it was hilarious, and I thought, well, this is a piece that might make people chuckle, which leads to my real intention, which was as a Trojan horse of a piece to get people to realise that the thing that had brought me to this point was, um, se you know, serious case of sepsis, and uh, uh, perhaps we should say a little bit about what ICU delirium is and um, I mean I hand over to you as the as the as the expert to define it. Um, yeah of, of course and, and you do a fantastic job of describing it in in lay language and your in your blog at delirium tremendous on, on tortoise media but you know this is something that affects a lot of people who've been in intensive care and, and it's really down to a combination of things it's down to the the very potent 
often sedative drugs that we're giving to patients. It's down to a disturbance of the sort of day-night equilibrium, the fact that there's always bright lights and strange alarms and so forth, as well as a consequence of the underlying illness. And, and sepsis causes something we call sepsis-associated encephalopathy, which is a great way of saying that the illness causes the brain to be a bit scrambled. And, it, and it's a combination of these factors that we don't yet fully understand. There is a lot of research going on as to how we can mitigate this, but a majority of people who spend more than a couple of days in intensive care suffer this very, very real delirium. And some of the most common things are hallucinations around, you know, spiders or other creatures crawling around. It's very, very common to think that the health professionals looking after them are either keeping them prisoner or trying to conduct experiments on them. And I, I think you describe some of that. And, you know, this really is important to get this across because, frankly, people who are less you know, articulate and dare I say brave than you in terms of being willing to share their story might keep quiet about this and it might traumatise them for a long time. I mean, the reason, as I said, you know, the, the, the hallucinations I, I had were so, you know, almost all funny that it, there was, you know, it wasn't really that brave to share them, it, um, unless you take yourself too seriously, which I hope I don't. And um, the, the principal hallucination, I mean, the thing to say first of all about hallucination, which I'd n never appreciated, um, not having had one, was that to the person experiencing the hallucination, it's absolutely real. It's not um, it's 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 not a sort of psychedelic experience. It's you know, you, you'll one day you'll you, you know, I can remember vividly from the same period. Doctors doing their rounds and nurses taking bloods, the usual uh, and food arriving and so on. But inter, inter spliced with that and completely consistent with it. And often at the same time, by the way, it was like what they call what tech people call augmented reality, where, you, you know, you've got your actual situation, but into it come strange and, and unexplained phenomena. So my principal delusion was that I was writing and um, convalescing so that I could star in an HBO um action series about two spies when i was one of them and my russian co-star dimitri would occasionally this person does not exist never has um, <laughs> came to visit me quite often um and the detail of the hallucinations was was absolutely compelling and this and the idea um the brain's extraordinary because it, it sort of it finds a way of rationalizing even the most demented um hallucinations was that the, the hospital was earning some money on the side as a sort of co-production studio for the for the for the for the for the HBO series and um, I rambled on about this uh, all the time and to very long-suffering nurses and doctors who I think they were you know as delirium goes it was on the funny rather than disturbing side so I you know I wasn't screaming or terrified which I, I could have been in other circumstances and I think they just thought there he goes again um, and in fact when I revisited that ward when my father was unwell in, in, in I think 2018 some of the doctors were still there who treated me and I remembered them and they and they remembered it and they were still laughing so that was nice <laughs> um, um, but it but the thing to say is about it was that it as funny as it was, it was absolutely real to me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as I say in the piece, my first words when my father came to visit me after I'd come out of the coma was, Dad, you've got to get on to my agent because we need to talk about, you know, amending the contract on this. And he, you know, he was a very uh, compassionate and pragmatic man and unflappable. And he, he, he nodded, yes, of course, I'll, I'll get on that right away. Um, but it must have been very stressful because... I think, you know, he, for him, I think that the, the thought was, oh, God, you know, has his mind been capsized permanently? And uh, of course, uh, what was interesting was that the delirium faded. But actually, it, 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 it and I mean, I gather this is quite usual. It took a while for it all to wash yeah. away. You know, there was still, um, I mean, the, well, part, one of the parts of the delirium was the hallucination was that I'd, um, I traveled to America and I remember when I got back after being discharged from hospital, I did check my passport, which shows you that even when I was, you know, notionally better um, in that sense, at least 
I was still suffering from some of the sort of after effects. And um, so it, it, I was really, and looking back on it, and, and even now I'm still, you know, really struck by the sheer power mm. of the initial disease and then the the consequences of it. It it it, it totally turned me tumbling. And um, you know, it, it 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 has it gives me pause for thought every day. Yeah, it's sort of almost as though you're describing a a totally rational and considered approach to a fully irrational alternative universe. It, it's uh, it's well, astonishing. It, 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 it is because, I mean, obviously what I do for a living, which is, you know, I write and edit, um, is, you know, has its roots in the idea of um, gathering evidence, reasonable um, analysis of what you found out about whatever it is, and, um, you know, a life devoted to that. And this was an experience that completely challenged that way of living and it made me realize how fragile that membrane is actually that it, it doesn't take much to just completely knock you off that way of, of experiencing the world and into, into a, um, a, a, a sort of realm of perception where you know fortunately I was seeing merchandise testing and um, you know first <laughs> first 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 production loops on a real and things um, but you know, I my good friend David Aronovich, who who um, is a very very good columnist and journalist, had ICU delirium, and he saw you know monsters and zombies, and uh, imagined that there were a group of South African anti semites in the next room plotting to um, kill him. And and I met up with David after uh, I was um, discharged, and and you know we I was telling him how how because I'd read about his experience and been you know very alarmed by it, and he. He said, yeah, you know, that's not, that's not how it was for me. It really wasn't. No, absolutely. And just to reinforce to listeners, well, we're really two things. You know, firstly, staff in intensive care and around intensive care on the wards receiving people from the back. We are fully aware of, of these issues and, and, you know, we we do do our best to show empathy. And I, and I almost well i'm almost certain that the doctor who's now chuckling wouldn't have been chuckling while these uh, hallucinations no, were real to you and... they were flawlessly uh, um understanding and mm. i mean what what they clearly judged out out of many hundreds of hours of experience was that this was a hallucination where there was no harm in being quasi complicit yeah. In other words, I wasn't ranting and raving and screaming and, and uh, you know, I was bragging about how I was going to win an Emmy. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you're if you're doing basic tests, the best thing probably is just to say, that's right, Mr. Dancona, you know, and yeah. good luck with that. And they did. Yeah. And, and, and um, you know, they were very. I, I can't I can't praise them highly enough because I, I can't imagine. And, you know, this this um my admiration uh, during covid on the, on this just went through the roof is i can't imagine what it must be like to work on an icu and the fact that they were able in addition to everything else they're dealing with to deal with patients such as myself who are awake and in these very sort of um askew uh, psychological conditions uh, were it, it was very impressive you know in retrospect it was the way that uh, nobody at any point ever said um, anything sort of aggressive like mm -hmm. stop talking nonsense ever you know that it was it was all just just right um, and and it, my off-ramp from hallucination was was quite smooth if not, I, I suspect I mean there was one moment I remember when um, vividly i was in a general ward by then and i realized i'd been talking nonsense and i was just ever so slightly disappointed that i wasn't going to be doing an hbo series <laughs> well <laughs> fantasy, who, who, who knows <laughs> maybe, maybe it'll come with time so um you know so just you you've obviously 
brilliantly used your your personal story there and you described this as a as a trojan horse to sort of yeah. start the conversation around sepsis and and as a charity we we think it's it's enormously important and sorry by the way just before i go on i must mention that our support nurses are there to listen to people with stories like yours and, and try to help so that's a service our charity provides yeah. but I, it's been very difficult in the post-COVID landscape to raise attention to other healthcare issues. And, and one observation I'd made just yesterday at the point of recording is our, our friends at the British Heart Foundation issued an alarming um, press release to show that there have been 100,000 excess deaths from cardiovascular disease over the last three years. Now, there wasn't a lot of pickup of this from the mainstream media, or certainly not as much as one might have expected in 2019 before COVID. So with World Sepsis Day approaching on September the 13th, how important is it? And you know, what are the sort of duties of editors to raise awareness of these other healthcare conditions? And how can small to medium sized charities like ours really begin to break through this post COVID noise and highlight conditions that are just as important for the public to be aware of? Well, it, well it's such a good question, isn't it? I mean, one of the things I think that um, is positive already about the COVID inquiry is that um, people are becoming aware at how, as it were, COVID inevitably, um, you know, drove a lot of bandwidth away from other um, conditions and, and it does so to this day, but also it's shown how it, it, it had an impact upon those uh, diseases and illnesses and so on. Um, and I and I think that's it's good that that's being becoming a sort of ish headline grabbing issue. I mean, on the question of how to raise awareness, I don't think there's a there's a cookie cutter one size fits all answer to this. But I do think that um, the two things that tend to grab editors' attentions are case studies, um, whether they are, you know, funny like mine or sadly, you know, tragic. Um, and that definitely grabs people's attention because I think that the you know the story we hear again and again about sepsis and I was an example of that but it was it wasn't any medical practitioner's fault it was my fault was not getting the diagnosis in quickly enough and um, you know my what it sort of made me uh, almost uh, evangelical about is that I think that when people are feeling unwell um, we know that a GP only has seven minutes on average with their patient. And I think that the could it be sepsis line is a very strong one. And I think that it's it, it, it's it's good to have people um, who've been through sepsis saying in interviews and things how asking that question saved their lives or tragically how it, that question not being asked led to lost lives because the, the difficulty is that this, the, the, the symptoms are, they're symptoms that are, you know, um, associated with many other conditions. And I, I think that I wish I had just said at some point, you know, could it, could it be sepsis? Because, it, because it, it, in retrospect, it's a very, you know, it's a very, I can see my path to intensive care absolutely clearly I mean it's I can the, the symptoms are clear it's obvious not obvious but it's it, 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 it's quite clear that that something of that gravity was wrong and and in terms of getting media coverage of it I think that, uh, that as I said case studies are hugely important and in, in fact the mail the Daily Mail brought up my tortoise piece so you know that was good because that then went to a you know, a huge readership. Um, and I think that, that that's a, that's an example of the case study. The other thing that, that, that grabs attention is, is you know, new data. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a voracious appetite for data, uh, whether it's polls or, um, you know, uh, information about patients' progress or, 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 or whatever. Um, and, 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 and also, um, you know, on, on, on days like the one you just mentioned, trying to get, I think, health correspondents and if possible, and this is the hardest bit, editors to um, to realise this is a clear and present danger. And it's 
in the world in which we live, uh, it's very hard now to get people into one space. However, the one thing that the COVID experience did do was it normalised the Zoom call or the you know Microsoft call or the Google call. And I think that the, the case for having um, mini seminars where you say to bits of the journalistic community, the media community, I'm going to do someone like yourself, I'm going to do half an hour on why this matters is very appealing. And I think it's a, that's a, that's a new format for journalists and one which is extremely useful for charities such as the Trust, because um, saying come to this location at this time, then suddenly another story breaks and then they don't turn up. But if you say I'm going to do half an hour at 4.30 on Thursday afternoon and I'm going to give you some very interesting uh, new data or new points or a new story. And I think that suddenly draws people in. And, um, you know, it, the, 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 there is there is unfortunately no magic bullet with with um, how do you get the media's attention? But I, I do think one of the things that that all the sepsis stories I've ever read have in common is there's a sort of sudden moment of acceleration where it goes from being just feeling wrong to off, you know, very often life-threatening situations. And that's not always the case. And I think that um, that acceleration is, is where the media's interest probably will lie. Because it's, it, I realise just from my own experience that it can happen to anybody. You know, and tragically, I've heard it about it happening to children. You know, how, it, 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 it is an equal opportunity illness in that respect. Um, there are, it really is. And um, it's, it's one of those illnesses that absolutely everybody needs to have or their parents has to have a minimal awareness of, I think. Um, it's, it's not, you know, I'm a 55 year old male. I need to obviously be uh, thinking more about diet and exercise than I was when I was 20, let's say, you know, um, uh, but this is not like that. This is a disease that ev absolutely everybody needs to know about. Yeah, and yeah, I, I feel that pain as someone also in their 50s. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, for listeners, just to, just to reinforce, this is by no means a niche illness. Not WHO sure. data show that this is responsible for one in five lives lost worldwide. Again, the WHO data show that this claims more lives than cancer, not diminishing how important it is that we improve outcomes from cancer. But this is huge. It's eclipsed only by cardiovascular disease. And there's a fine line, isn't there, between uh, sort of um, scaremongering and responsibly raising awareness. And one example of that that we've been involved in recently is a storyline on Coronation Street, where a young man called Ryan Connor developed sepsis. He's played by the actor Ryan Prescott, played brilliantly, may I add. And he was hospitalised, but actually got better within a couple of days and, and didn't didn't end up in intensive care. Now, that is a real and uh, relevant story. We see people with sort of very mild sepsis coming in. We can turn them around relatively quickly, but they are usually a minority. And of course, in response to that, many of our supporters who'd had more in-depth experiences such as you had uh, fed back to us and said, well, you know, he got better too quickly. He, he wasn't sick enough. So I think do you have any commentary on on this fine line? We we don't want to scaremonger. The last thing we want to do is to flood emergency departments and GP surgeries with the worried well. But but secondly, you know, how important it is is it for us to be real about this and concede that actually not everybody becomes critically ill and spends fourteen days in intensive care. But at the other extreme, there are people who do and who lose limbs and who have PTSD and uh, and and so forth. So. We I, well, about I, case it's studies. a very good question. I mean, um, I totally understand the, the feeling of um, survivors that the, the storyline should have gone on longer. But I think as an introductory, um, as it will have been for, I suspect, the vast majority of viewers, plotline, it was very good. Um, and even if it wasn't precisely what everyone wanted, let's not let the good be the enemy of the best, right? Um, getting on Coronation Street is a huge achievement for uh, any issue, you know, or EastEnders. I mean, that that's a huge win. 
Um, and, you know, there are other, I mean, what, what was, was the movie, was it Starfish, the movie about, um, I mean, that, you know, about guy who lost limbs and everything. I mean, yeah, I, that was the story of, of Tom Ray, played by Tom Riley. And, and um, yeah, it's an incredibly powerful story. It's, a, it's an independent movie. It, uh, you know, was not a box office hit. But as you say, it's called Starfish. It's out there for people to download and what, and it, you know, all I can say is have a box of tissues ready. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's I incredibly it, moving. I watched it extremely foolishly soon after I came out. <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those real there, but for the grace of God, go I moments. Um, but uh, but I, I think anything that that spreads the the cultural footprint of of of, of a disease and an awareness of it is to the good. Um, and I'm sure, you know, speaking personally, I will write at greater length at some point about this because um it, it i tell you it stays with you you know it's it, you 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 do feel um when you've had a brush with mortality and i gather this is very common it changes your attitude to life so um you know i i do think about it every day and how lucky i am and and part of that luck i think is is a duty to kind of um spread the word about what caused the initial um dies with death and i think that you know always and, and i think the trust does this very well you you need a community of people and communicators and people associated with them and and sadly the bereaved who 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 you can kind of uh, mobilize to to talk about what they went through and um perhaps give set you know layman's hints on how that experience could have been better you know if it is the case that i i could have I could have intercepted it a lot earlier and I didn't and I was very lucky. Um, so you, you're constantly looking for ways of humanizing the story because that I, I think, I mean, what you just said about the, 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 the as it were, the, the, the ranking of sepsis in, in, in the global league table, as, as it were, um, is, it, it, it is really chastening. And, and I think that that, that, alone is um cause for the media to to write more about it and i think they're getting better but there's still a lot more that could be done and i also think that you know the more kind of um movies and and soaps and so on that that, that include this as part of the warp and weft of their story the better because it, it communicates to people um something that is commonplace if you like in 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 something that they experience through the screen um, i was talking once to someone who's involved in um autism awareness work about rain man the movie mm. which has been criticized as being you know not 100 percent accurate you know dustin hoffman's portrayal is not necessarily 100 percent right but he said very interestingly um it doesn't really matter because it made people Thing, you know, there's a movie with Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman, which is centered on the autism, the you know, serious autism of, a, of, a, of an adult and its consequences when they're on the road. And that was a transformative moment for autism awareness, you know, and and so I, I do think there's something in that um, it, it is. It, culture on all its levels has immense power uh, as an educative force. Yeah, and, and I think it's also about being relatable, isn't it? You know, yeah, people totally. people know Dustin Hoffman and his characters and they can relate to that personality. And and similarly with Ryan and Coronation Street, this was a, yes. you know, a, a, a strong and charismatic young man. And you might think that such people are invincible, but of course he succumbed, and this is real life again, to a very, very common and, and prevalent condition. I would reinforce that these things don't just happen. You know, um, you mentioned BBC's EastEnders, they've been brilliant at having our posters in their medical centres, um, which is a sort of subliminal way of raising awareness. Yes. Coronation Street storyline, we were heavily involved in editing scripts. The, the, the script writers were very clear from the outset that Ryan wasn't going to have a lingering period in hospital. He was going to recover quite yeah. quickly. So we had to work around that, but make it realistic. And, you know, just to hammer home, this is around a charity trying to be responsible. It's trying to tell real stories that hopefully just encourage and empower people that if they are faced with a similar uh, situation to just ask, could it be sepsis? 
And I think but, empowerment's really important because um, I, I, my sense is that as 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 a, as a layman journalist, but with an in, interest in these issues, um, is that we're moving into it as people live longer. We're moving into a different phase of medicine and how it's practiced, in which empowerment's going to be more and more important. We're not expecting, you know, non-medical professionals to understand, you know, to be able to do differential diagnosis. That would be crazy. But, but nonetheless, the more that they're able to ask intelligent questions of themselves, and just that checklist on the could it be sepsis thing, you know, and seeing it on the wall of uh, and of course, you know, uh, my children and I have become, they're grown up now, but, you know, they've, they've, we've become kind of eagle eyed at seeing that wherever it is. And they go, ah, you know, could it be sepsis, Dad? And um, it's really good because you just look at it and as you say, you kind of subliminally take it in. And it, it, it might not look like much on the wall of office, but it is. It really is because you suddenly, first of all, it, 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 it promotes the word sepsis to part of the sort of generality of healthcare concern. And I think that's a bit that's actually been a big and underrated win for the trust is that it's kind of got sepsis into the health conversation. We know that people are becoming more health aware, but what I think that that um, that 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 if that you know that slogan that what that series of questions does is it makes people um, internalize a series of questions that would not have been the case 20 years ago. And I think it will. I I don't know. I can't. I can't prove this. Of course, this is just hunch. But I think it will save lives in that sense. It just means, you know, when you go to your GP, um, who's overworked and trying, trying with the best intentions just to get you out the door, as it were, for the next fifteen appointments, to say, you know, it, dog, is there any chance this could be sepsis? That's that's a massive breakpoint socially. You know, if you get to that point and then the GP will say, well, actually, you might be right or whatever. Terrific. And that means less people go, to, as I did, to A&E with sepsis. Um, it, I mean, that that's that I think is the what you want to do is minimize the number of people who if when they get the condition, uh, you know, their first form of real treatment is is um, is in is in an emergency room. Absolutely. And and I will acknowledge that there are sectors of the community, particularly underrepresented um, uh, sectors of the community, those perhaps for whom English isn't a first language, those whose uh, culture um, uh, encourages them to access media that we wouldn't consider to be mainstream, um, and those who are digitally illiterate or can't afford to be digitally literate, that we need to do a lot better in common with most small to medium sized charities at reaching those communities. But it is hard work. We are committed yes. to it, but it's hard. It's it, it, it's tough. Now, I, we, we can't talk about sepsis, Matthew, certainly at a policy level without considering antimicrobial resistance. Now, Antimicrobial resistance is fueled by multiple factors, evolution being the main one. But um, of course, we have to concede that around half of antimicrobial use is in areas like intensive farming in non-human use. But in human use, of course, we use antibiotics to try to stop people coming to harm from infection. And that use will, of course, speed the progression of AMR. The two are hand in hand. They're intrinsically interlinked. And of course, AMR is an existential crisis to, to, to humankind. And if we don't have effective antimicrobials, frankly, we won't be able to treat people with sepsis. And, and then the sort of one in five deaths it, it claims worldwide is going to rise to probably one in two without, without concerted action. How important is it from the perspective of the media that we acknowledge the interlinkage between these conditions? And how can we really raise this from a media perspective so that it can become a policy priority to bring sepsis and AMR together? Well, it's a, I mean, that's a huge and brilliant and difficult to answer question. <laughs> that's um, right. No, but I, I th well, the first thing I think is that um, health journalism at the moment has been disfigured, uh, not disfigured, that's wrong because it's, it is actually reflecting a reality, but the the crisis in the NHS um, 
has sort of is overwhelming everything else. And um, it's it's the top line story and rightly so. Uh, and it, and 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 so getting other stories in is harder. However, um, part of the answer to and I come back to that point about, you know, new new the new model of medicine is to try and explain the inter how everything is interlinked and interdependent. And that, I mean, the whole question of antimicrobial resistance is uh, not just for sepsis, but for, 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 for mankind is, is, is one of the great medical stories of the 21st century. And I think that, you know, the medical literacy is, is something that everybody should have not everyone can have it up to the level that you do, Ron, but, but and, and, and it would be obviously weird if they did. But um, the, 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 the trick is that we, we need to jolt patients out of passivity. Now, I think that th th there's been a great middle class surge of kind of health empowerment. Um, some of it, by the way, not all good. You know, I'm not wild about a lot of the... Um, alternative medicines that middle class people uh, you know take and, and and some of the impacts that's had upon you know cancer treatments for example and we, the data on that is very clear um so health wellness awareness is not always a positive thing however i think the harder thing is how do you get people who are at the moment wondering whether they can clothe feed and heat for their kids you know to think about complex health issues and the answer is you can't necessarily get them to think about the uh, the detail, but what you can do is say you you don't have to, this is your health service. You don't have to be a passive recipient of it. You can ask questions, and here are some of the basic ones you can. In terms of the of actual government policy, um, well, I mean here here we we here we are, and you know I I think it's 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 quite likely there's going to be a change of government and who knows one can never I mean one thing I learned in that that same year 2016 with Brexit and Trump was don't forecast <laughs> but um, that's a big opportunity to um, to influence health policy and to um, ask for answers from a new a new government is, is is a good one to ask for answers but you know what are you actually doing about this I mean let's say West Streeting becomes Health Secretary is a very able and um, uh, you know, talented and, and re receptive politician. OK, you know, at some I mean, we're, we are massively sort of hypothesizing here, but at some point in, you know, the first six months to a year of his ten tenure of that that office, you know, you'll have a meeting with him uh, uh, and, and other people from the trust. And, and, and it'll be important to say, OK, well, well, what is your answer to this question? And I think that it's keeping up that pressure at that level as well as on media is really important because actually people people talk about health more than they used to but i think they make particularly on antibiotics i think they make assumptions about their permanence as a as a tool of of, of cure which are no longer safe and you know we, we need we need to work hard at, at making sure they understand that the research that the investment needs to go on uh, now more than ever and also we need to and this drives me up the wall but you know the, the bar some of the barriers that have uh, emerged since brexit to um cooperation between uh, countries on on this kind of thing are crazy and i'm i'm, I'm very hopeful for the future that some of those barriers might fall again because i think that international data comparison and uh, you know, active, um, uh, you know, alliances on this is absolutely of the, the highest importance because you know, the, the the connection between the two diseases that you the, the two issues that you highlight on is is central. It's crucial, and um, if it isn't addressed, frankly, as you say, more people will die. Uh, absolutely, and you know, just as a, a sort of way from my prejudice side of encapsulating this as food for thought for people as as we come to the end of this podcast is antimicrobial resistance AMR does not kill people. Untreatable infection 
kills people, sepsis kills people, and AMR is the vehicle by which that will happen more frequently. And, and I think listeners can reflect upon what, what, what they can do around these issues. Of course, in preventing sepsis, it's to live well, to avoid preventable infection, to have a sensible and healthy approach to antimicrobials, um, and to be empowered to just ask, could it be sepsis if they're really, really concerned? It is around thinking about our lifestyle and our consumption. And we've mentioned intensive farming where antibiotics in some countries are readily used as growth promoters. It's thinking about if we choose to eat meat, where that meat comes from, how we can avoid um, consuming antimicrobials that we don't need. So there are lots of actions that we can take. It's it's not just about policy, is it? Not at all. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned um you know, uh, food, for example. Um, one of my bugbears is that the the ingredients on the side of food, uh, food products, is so small. And I, I, you know, this is not an accident that they're almost microfiche size. <laughs> now, I'd like I'd like to see some new regulation that means that, that the ingredients and the method by which uh, a food product is being produced um, should be clearly legible. You know, you don't have to get out binoculars to read them. I think that that um, having an edu- educated citizenry is, and not just by the way in healthcare. This is kind of one of the great issues of our time. You know, how do you get back to um, a, a citizenry that's essentially scared by social media to one that's informed by good information? Is the in a way the big task of the next <laughs> twenty years? Um, and you know, medicine is in the uh, absolute vanguard of this because. Um, we all know that uh, a lot of, um, a, uh, you know, um, anti-science and um, nonsense is, is weapon about disease and illness is weaponized on social media in spite of the best efforts of the platform, some platforms to to reduce that. And so on that level, the, the fight has got harder. But I do think that um, there are lots and lots of quite simple things that can be done to make people aware of what they're putting in their bodies, how they're treating their bodies. There are incredibly simple physical tools that can allow people you know um it seems to me that that, that it's a no-brainer that um gym memberships should be a, a tax break i mean that 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 would not lose the treasury a huge amount of uh, revenue and it, it would it would give people the ability and access to um you know make themselves and their families that much fitter or or, or a swimming pool or something i don't know but but there are there are policy levers you can pull on this in terms of preventive medicine that are not really not rocket science they really aren't and um uh you know i wince when i i read that um that the government has has um has reneged on its promises uh, for for two for one offers you know the kind of um the vacillation on junk food and so on has been shocking i think and and um it's not nanny statism to want to have a population that are healthy and well looked after it's 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 ethically great but it's also very very good um fiscal practice because an nhs that is less burdened by people who haven't looked after themselves and not burdens the wrong word but you know um uh, having to deal with is 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 going to be that much less expensive and can spend the money on other things and i think that these are so, in a way these are so extraordinarily obvious these points that it tells you a lot about how we need a better way of, uh, from the very top down, of, of looking at the way health works um, to, to get to a place that is obviously to everyone's benefit. You know, from, from us as patients, you as senior practitioners, the treasury is the, the place that pays for it all. It, 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 all add, it, it all comes together. That This stuff is not asking for more money. It's actually asking to spend the money the NHS has um, in a more focused way and and to assist people with not having to go in as I did with with a case of sepsis um which should be the objective of us all surely yeah no I I couldn't agree more Matthew and with, without wishing wishing to get too political on this I I I lament the change of name from Public Health England to the UK Health Security Agency. I think we absolutely need to get back to be to prioritising the health of our population. It, ra- um, it, ra- it rather makes it sound like a sort of um, 
Mission Impossible kind of a bioterrorism agency. Yes, yeah, right. it, it really does. It, it's quite, it, it's quite scary. And it would be remiss of me, you know, talking about antimicrobial resistance, not to uh, acknowledge that the UK is one of the leading countries in terms of reducing antibiotic use as growth promoters in intensive farming. I think, you know, there's a huge amount that we've covered there. And, and I think this this sort of closing segment of this is, is really another podcast by itself and, and one that really will stimulate debate. But it, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> no. Matt, Matthew, um, that that is all we've got time for. And, and thank you so much for taking the time, not only to share your personal story and really would encourage people to, to read Delirium Tremendous on Tortoise Media, as well as your expert, of course, insight into the media landscape. Um, be sure to join us next month as we lead up to World Sepsis Day in September. And don't forget, if you want more information about sepsis or if you need support, whether you're the individual affected or their families, head to our website, sepsistrust.org. Matthew, thank you and see you thank next you. time.